Well, I don't think it's the country. I think it's the fellows that's running the country. 81-year-old war veteran Jim Baxter says all he wanted was an explanation, and what he received was an insult. The Scarborough residents served in the Navy in World War II and then in the Merchant Navy, and wants a veteran's benefit so far he's been denied. Frustrated, he and his wife Mary wrote a letter to Scarborough Southwest MP Tom Wapel. Wapel sent them this letter in response. It reads, I am puzzled. According to my records, you were a past supporter of mine, yet it seems that in this past election you supported the Canadian Alliance candidate. How is it that you are writing me for help if you did not think enough of my abilities to justify voting for me? Well, it was a little disturbing. I mean, I asked him a question and get, and get a letter like that and then to find out how he knew that I had voted. Tom Wapel is in Eastern Canada working with the Fisheries and Oceans Committee. We spoke to a representative from his office. She told us Mr. Wapel would not be issuing a statement that he says the letter stands on its own. Wapel has served the residents of Scarborough since 1988. Some say he won last November's election based on his experience. But now constituents in this riding say they are stunned. I have met him on a number of occasions and I'm quite surprised at his reaction. Um, I certainly had more respect for the gentleman than that. And didn't think that he would uh, respond in that manner. I was uh, appalled. I mean, how can they do that? You know, you trust that uh, whoever is in the in who represents the government should help, regardless of who you vote for. This is democracy again. I'm saying, you know. Jack Fortnum served in the Navy between 1943 and 1946, and says he's worried about how our youth will view this story. They're very impressionable right now, and uh, th this is a time when they should be. Uh, taught the importance of what the veterans did do. Catherine Hill helps run a veterans home for the aged in Scarborough and says Wapel should resign. I think it's an awful statement about Canada throughout the world. Imagine people across the world picking up this article and saying that's how you treat your veterans. Baxter says he's overwhelmed with all the phone calls and the support he has been receiving from veterans across the country. As for the next election, when asked who he will vote for, Baxter simply told us it depends on who's running. At the Royal Canadian Legion on Kennedy Road, Teresa Madalino, Scarborough News. I see you're uh, working hard. Oh, yeah. What is that? It's a seat. It's going to be the seat for my bike. Oh, really? Scarborough Southwest oh. Member of Parliament Tom Wapel has issued a letter of apology to Scarborough War veteran Jim Baxter. After Baxter sent a letter to Wapel asking why he had been denied veterans' benefits, Wapel responded in a written response, stating he was surprised Baxter was seeking his help after not voting for him in the last election. Wednesday, Baxter's story received nationwide coverage. Thursday, Wapel issued this statement. With the benefit of hindsight, I accept the criticism leveled against me that the letter showed lack of judgment. I should not have sent it. I sincerely regret any distress that my letter has caused Mr. Baxter or anyone else. Thursday, Scarborough News caught up with Jim's wife, Mary, over the phone to get her reaction. I believe he issued it because of all the publicity that has ensued from this issue. He was uh, compelled to issue something uh, a little more conciliatory than how he was responding yesterday, I would say. Wapal has also assured Prime Minister Jean Chrétien he is prepared to do whatever he can to help Baxter. The first month I didn't even have money to pay my daughter's metro pass to go to school. My daughter sell one of her trumpets just, just to have enough money to continue going to school. Elini Iraklio says another financial blow to her family is just too much to bear. The Scarborough mother of three has become a full-time caregiver for her husband Marios after he suffered a stroke while driving his ambassador cab last winter. The car remains parked here in the back of the family's Scarborough apartment. They haven't been able to earn any money from it ever since the stroke because his permit holder, Marios, is the only one allowed to drive it. And now he's without a license. Here's the problem. Unlike regular taxi licenses, the city's new ambassador license cannot be sold or leased to any other drivers. Elini says the policy is unfair, especially when her son is willing to take over the cab for a while to help out the family. He doesn't want to do this as his profession, but for the time being to help the family until they said all these things, he's willing to do it if they allow him to do it. 
But the city's rules don't allow for family members to take over either. The question asks, can the family have a second driver on the, the car? The answer is no. Taxi licensing manager Richard Mucha says there are no exceptions written into the bylaw. On Monday, the Toronto Ambassador Association and several cab drivers packed a planning and transportation meeting asking the city to issue more plates. Over the weekend, that same group towed Mario's cab to Ontario Place to help rally support for his family. I'd be willing to go to bat for them to see if an exception can be made uh, to, to let the younger guy drive. Councillor Brad Duguid says he feels sorry for the family, but believes the new ambassador system is working well, so the city has to be careful how they handle this one. It's a very important to recognize, though, that you wouldn't want to gut the reforms just to help out one person, because uh, those reforms have worked well, and we want to make sure that they stay in place. City staff say the Taxi Advisory Committee will most likely be discussing the issue of a second driver sometime this year, but so far there are no plans to change the bylaw. Meanwhile, the Iraklios family continue to suffer financially and make payments on a vehicle that may never be used for their business again. From the Taxi Industry Unit in the Civic Centre, Cindy Dexter, Scarborough News. Another boat is lowered into Scarborough's Bluffers Park Marina. While some boaters just come out for the hot season, an increasing number are calling the lakeside home. If the marina is going to be very aggressive, which they seem to have been in the past, then uh, this could be a, a real waterloo with respect to uh, permanent housing in public parks uh, in Toronto. Scarborough Bluffs Councillor Brian Ashton is just one politician taking a close look at the city's marina policy. This is his biggest concern, unmotorized vessels called houseboats. That's where the issue now has uh, surfaced, if I can use that word, where people such as myself are asking, do you want subdivisions in a public park? Should somebody be living in a house permanently in a public park? People who live on boats year-round are called liveaboards, and Bluffers Marina has been renting slips to year-round boaters for 14 years. And that's why General Manager George Rutley doesn't understand what all the fuss is about. They're registered vessels. We're in the business to, to rent slips. That's our business, that's our livelihood, and to service. Whether they're this type of vessel or a sailboat or any other type of vessel, they're registered, we can rent to them. And so they've found a loophole, and now they're beginning to build a subdivision in a private park, and I think that's fundamentally wrong. But the new trend in houseboats isn't the only issue the city is looking at. The number of liveaboards at commercially run marinas could be limited to 20%, and some say the year-round boaters don't pay their fair share of property tax. We do pay taxes. We treat every slip here is included in their slip fees. A portion is included for taxes. I would submit to you when the lease was cut and uh, agreed to between the city and the marina, it was never was ever considered to have houseboats as permanent uh, residential community in that marina. City Hall will be the center of attention Monday. Members of i the people who build houseboats, as well as liveaboards, will be downtown to hear what the Economic Development and Parks Committee has to say about the future of their marina lifestyle. At Queen and Bay Street, Lisa Fender, Scarborough News. This will be the first in Scarborough, and it will be a major undertaking uh, initiating a small projects that we can hopefully expand in other areas of the Scarborough area. Nicholas Volk says Scarborough could be the first to have city-owned property converted into affordable housing. The Habitat for Humanity volunteer pitched the project to the Administration Committee Tuesday without any objection. And actually, we have now completed 450 homes across Canada and expect to build 100 more this summer. Habitat for Humanity have selected two vacant lots here on Lucy Avenue. Now I'm standing in one of them. Their goal is to build one or two homes on each lot in order to provide home ownership opportunities for working families with low incomes. Families that eventually move into these homes near Danforth and Victoria Park will still have to pay property taxes and a mortgage, but the mortgage is interest free. Architect students from Ryerson have already come up with the design concept for the homes. They would do, a, say, a site analysis, program review, uh, research into various topics of uh, sustainable housing, uh, look at affordable uh, elements of the built environment and how they could put it together to come up with an economical house. The Ryerson professor says the project is a real challenge for students because they have a lot to consider. The houses are built have to be limited in size to about maximum 1200 square feet but they also have to be uh, designed taking into account that a lot of materials are volunteer, labor is volunteer materials are donated so that the coordination of the whole project is a big 
part of the effort. Councillor Brad Duguid says the project fits nicely with the city's housing first policy. All city owned lands uh, have to be considered for housing before they're, uh, they're declared for, for surplus and put on the open market and in this case we're looking at city owned lands that we will be contributing at a little bit less than market value to make this, uh, this particular project happen. Habitat for Humanity volunteers are also encouraging city councillors to source out properties in their wards for future projects. The Scarborough site is expected to be endorsed by city council at the end of May and construction could begin as early as next year. From the Habitat Restore, Cindy Dexter, Scarborough News. The bracelet it serves as the primary alerting device, as you say, for the first responder, be it the paramedic. In a life or death situation, this little bracelet could make the difference, telling emergency personnel what they need to know about a patient in an emergency situation, when seconds count. But according to Health Canada statistics, close to 100,000 Scarborough residents who should have it don't. Many times uh, individuals don't think they have a, a condition that's serious enough or that they would ever find themselves in an emergency. I guess we're all human, we hope that doesn't happen. Uh, so oftentimes that uh, folks are reluctant to take the step to get identification. Now the medical alert is a simple bracelet you wear on your wrist. On the back it has a collect hotline number and a list of medical conditions that emergency personnel should be aware of. There's five lines of information. We start with the most life-threatening condition and some of the conditions would be related to heart, diabetes, asthma, epilepsy, or in many cases allergies. The bracelet comes in several different styles, including one for the hockey fan. The service also provides a wallet-sized card. The card has information about the medications the card carrier is taking, medical history and allergies, including drug allergies. The biggest problem we have is people that are brought in unconscious for various reasons and they have an underlying medical history that we need to know about. Uh, we just had a patient that uh, is in coma now and it would be nice to, to have known that he is a diabetic. Scarborough Hospital's emergency physician Irv Pfefferman says the medic alert information helps him to know what to pay attention to and what to ignore. There are some people that have abnormal anatomy like uh, a pupil that may be a different size. They're born with this as a result of injury. If they come in unconscious and they have a medic alert that tells us that one pupil is larger than the other, that's also very important. Why is that? Because it's a, a sign that, that we would look for in a head injury and uh, one pupil larger than the other can have uh, various repercussions and mean certain underlying pathology. If the patient has this, has had this for all his life or her life, then we need to know that we wouldn't worry about it. So you want a sterling silver bracelet? This Toronto call centre has a staff of about a dozen people. Okay. Medic well, Alert has been around for 40 years. Now Medic Alert bracelets are not available in stores but for registration information you can pick up this brochure at doctor's offices and drug stores or call the 1-800 number. It's 1-800-668-1507 or contact Medic Alert at the website at medicalert.ca. At Shepherd Avenue and Don Valley Parkway, Sarah Minhas, Scarborough News. It's a, a step forward to trying to resolve and solve the problem rather than just uh, put them up for a night in a cell. Toronto City Council is behind the Emergency Medical Services proactive approach to health care. The Community Medicine Program was adopted Thursday by the Community Services Committee. The program will target those people who have difficulty accessing health care. Toronto EMS on the street 24 hours a day so it, it seems to be a logical approach in expanding the level and scope of practice of our paramedics. The program will work in partnership with public health and other community organizations to help the homeless, the mentally ill, the socially isolated and the elderly. Some of our older people are somewhat isolated from community. Uh, they, they have difficulty getting out of their, uh, their, room, their buildings or their rooms uh, and in this case uh, they could be targeted to, to be assisted in, in a program such as this as well. Targets within the program include tuberculosis skin testing, delivering health care to those with addictions to drugs and alcohol, and expanding the flu shot program to high-risk groups. By having paramedics out in the community addressing the less urgent medical needs, it will reduce the possibility of more severe problems down the road and hopefully lighten the load of our very stressed health care system. There's a large elderly population. Uh, they uh, use the emergency as their uh, sort of last resource because they haven't got the the ability to go to their family doctors on a frequent basis and when their illness evolves to such a state that they're quite ill then an ambulance is called they have to be brought here 
any program that could deal with this in the community and diagnose in the community and treat in the community rather than bringing them to emergency. As long as there's an alternate arrangement made so that these people could be taken elsewhere to be dealt with with minor problems, this would be fabulous and take a load off the departments. The program will also develop a hot weather alert. People in danger of heat-related health emergencies will be brought to cooling centers. A few years ago, over 500 people died in Chicago during a heat wave. So it's how we access that information, how we deal with that information, and how we ensure that the shut-ins and elders, elder poor and reclusives uh, are better served. The report will go to council at the end of May, and if it is passed there, EMS will start their pilot project targeting the inner city homeless, with hopes to expand the initiative citywide. At Toronto City Hall, Brooke Fontaine, Scarborough News. Although this sport dates back to the origins of Canada, the game of field lacrosse is foreign to most Scarborough students. But one local high school coach hopes to change that. Agent Court Collegiate's Jim Veltman, who is also the captain of the Toronto Rock lacrosse team, says Lady Luck played a big part. As most people know, extra cricket hasn't been uh, too full this year, and so that means there's more money in the phys ed budget. And I thought this would be a good year to ask for the money that's required to start a program when you got to buy nets and sticks and help guys with some equipment and you know lacrosse balls and that kind of thing uh, you know total came to about fifteen hundred dollars nice yeah! Wednesday the agent court Lancers beat out the competition to win their first victory of the season they defeated William Lyne McKenzie from North York four to two agent court is the only school in Scarborough to introduce the game of field lacrosse to its students the team has scheduled several exhibition games that'll last throughout the season students are hoping there'll be enough interest across the city to start a Toronto League in the future a few years we tried to start a team up when Mr. Veltman first got here and never really progressed but now this year that we got one so it's good to see hopefully other schools as I know friends from other schools have been trying to start a team so hopefully it'll expand throughout Toronto. Run it! Run it! Run it! You're on! Veltman has been playing lacrosse for close to 30 years and students say they're fortunate to have him as their coach. Move it up! Move it up! He's a cool guy. He makes you feel like you're part of the team and he tries to get everyone on the field and he gives everyone a try but he, he also like he teaches very well since he's a star on the rock. Veltman says he would like to see women take interest in the sport and is more than willing to offer information right. to anyone yeah, interested in coaching a female lacrosse team at the school. Agent Court has a long history of strong athletic talent and with Jim Veltman coaching, the students are hoping to one day build a championship team. At Agent Court Collegiate, Julie Brown, Scarborough News. the roar of the engine, see the glare of polished chrome. For riders everywhere, biking season has arrived. Well, it's just so much fun, that's all. It's, it's a lot of fun. You have to do it. Everybody has to do it. I don't know why they don't. There are dozens of bikes from hogs to Hondas, and once they hit the road, they take on a style of their own. Vince Piazza runs a bike repair shop on St. Clair Avenue. He says bikers are made up of all types, but one thing binds them together, obsession. A lot of them are uh, just plain old working class type of people uh, that enjoy the, um, their motorcycles. And uh, they range from, um, you know, like police officers to lawyers to just a regular everyday person who just loves their bike probably more than their car and their wives sometimes. There are at least a dozen groups across the city. The Blue Knights, the Gold Wing Touring Association, and the Harley Owners Group, to name a few. So what is it about this hobby? The answer all around is freedom. What's the farthest you've ridden? Uh, Greenville, South Carolina. We did it in two days. It isn't cheap either. This bike is worth $42,000, custom made by Scarborough Police Officer John Cilia. Would you believe him if he told you he plans to sell? I have it on uh, the internet right now on eBay and uh, some papers in the city here. Why sell? Just uh, done it and uh, it's the second one I've built. Uh, I want to move on to the next project. So Gord, what do you call your bike? This is my mistress. Why mistress? Well. It cost me just about as much and it's the only one my wife lets me have. It's a well-known fact that the biking community is a very tight-knit group, but if you're going to be part of the scene, you have to know how to dress and you also have to be ready to pitch in. And pitch in you should, Lisa. You've missed a spot over here. Missed a spot? I can see my face, Frank. I know, but here, look over here. Oh, jeez. Cleaning up for biking season. Lisa Fender, Scarborough News. Come on, Frank, this is good? The cleaner it is, the better it will ride. Look over here.
before you strap on your helmet and rev up your engine, it is important to make safety your first priority. This according to Canada Safety Council. Scarborough Centennial College provides training programs organized by the council. It teaches all ages of drivers, not just young, but also young and old, and all different varieties of drivers, that the proper basic uh, techniques and habits of riding a motorcycle to make them safe riders and good conscious riders out on the road. Ottaway and other highly trained instructors have been running the course at Centennial College for 19 years. The course is done over the course of a week and uh, it's done a Friday night uh, in class theory uh, along with some paperwork that has to be done and then all day Saturday riding on the motorcycles with one hour of theory at the end of the day and then on the Sunday is another complete day of just riding with the uh, minister test applied at the end of the day. Canada doesn't offer mandatory motorcycle training programs, which means anyone can walk into the Ministry of Transportation, write the M1 test, and start riding. Slip the clutch, find the friction point. Students agree courses such as this one teach important skills that should go hand in hand with having a license. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Even having rode motorcycles as a kid, um, I guess I've picked up and learned lots of bad habits that I now have to <laughs> shed and redo all over again, learning the more basics and safer skills for riding. I mean, even experienced riders, I don't think it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to... Uh, improve on your your skills on not every year maybe maybe every other year rider refresher courses are also offered to anyone wanting to brush up on their techniques for anyone interested in learning how to safely ride a motorcycle centennial college offers programs every weekend except long weekends through until october for scarborough news i'm julie brown let's go i am going to the game tonight i need to get rid of this blue i'm purple Perfect! It's exactly what I need! Well, the Leafs are out and the rush for Purple Gear Friday at stores like Sports Fantasy in the Scarborough Town Center is on. The Raptor sales have been pretty strong all the way through the playoffs, uh, but it seems now that the focus is much more on them. Uh, once the Leafs go out, uh, people have been, like today for example, we've had about three or four calls already since 9 o'clock for Raptors jerseys, flags, etc. And, and a lot of the stuff is sold out. I was looking for a Raptors uh, jersey specifically for my godson's birthday. He's a big Raptors fan and he's, he's just six years old, so <laughs> he's already a sports nut. The Raptors in the second round of playoff games are playing in what is considered their most successful year yet. Fans are pretty confident they'll beat out Philadelphia to move on to the next round. I think they're going to have a tough time with Philly, but um, they'll probably take it in six because, you know, Iverson can't score 54 points every game. I think in the East, anyone can beat anyone, so I think the Raptors have a good shot because... Vince Carter is way better than Iverson. If you're not lucky enough to have one of these babies for Friday or Sunday's games, there are plenty of bars and restaurants throughout Scarborough who will be showing it. And places like Jack Astor's near the Scarborough Town Centre will be going all out. In fact, uh, some of the people have been saying here, other than being at the ACC, this is the best place to be to watch the game because of the excitement and the energy. So uh, it, it's great. We've got a lot of contests, free prizes, uh, little mini games that we run and some of our fabulous uh, video games that we've got here. In total, Jack Astor's has 82 televisions, 18 of them big screens. Managers say baseball and hockey playoff games always draw large crowds, usually bringing them to capacity with about 850 people but they're thrilled the number of Raptors fans are catching up. This has been a learning experience for us this year even, and we are very, very excited and impressed by the number of people coming out for just the Raptors games. There have been uh, a couple of situations where you've had both on the, on the same day, but uh, where we have Raptors games on their own, we're getting crowds that are about three quarters the size of what we've been getting for Leafs games. And for those of you really jumping on the Raptors bandwagon last minute and want to brush up on some of the rules and strategies, you can visit their website at www.nba.com backslash Raptors and check out the basketball use section so you're not completely left in the dark. In the Rogers Newsroom, Jennifer Stanley, Scarborough News. In terms of, of ecosystems, a wetland has more species than forests and meadows and all the other types of habitat there are. So a new series is coming to Scarborough News. If you are a nature lover, environmentalist, or just looking for something to do close to home, stay tuned for In the Rouge, hosted by yours truly and produced by Ramona Wall. We'll be looking at the people, the places, the issues, um, what, what kinds of uh, different natural features we have here, what are the issues that threaten the Rouge, 
and uh, what can people do? The Rouge Valley system stretches up from the Scarborough Pickering border to Stouffville and is bordered by Richmond Hill on the My west. Community. President of Save the Rouge Valley the system, the Glenda Bearmaker, will be one of many experts used on In the Rouge. Citizens since 1975 have been working to protect the Rouge and because of a huge outcry uh, back in the 80s, um, the Ontario government came out and said we're going to create the largest urban park in Canada. Scarborough has 5,000 acres of the park just in Scarborough alone with another 8,000 acres north of Steeles Avenue. The Rouge is known as wild in the city, home to hundreds of species from animals to plants, making it the perfect place to get out and enjoy nature. The first thing about being out here and being wild in the Rouge is just to respect what's here and, um, and just enjoy what's here. Uh, the, there's hiking, there's fishing, camping, um, photography, bird watching, just uh, so many activities that you can do in the Rouge. Watch for In the Rouge every Wednesday on Scarborough News beginning May 16th. And as you heard earlier, there are hundreds, probably thousands of topics we have to explore and we will cover them rain or shine. But now it's time for me to get out of the Rouge and into some dry clothes. Lisa Fender, Scarborough News. The programs on Rogers Television are made possible in part by the support of local sponsors. The Waterfront, unique, casual and fine dining. Overlooking beautiful Lake Ontario, the Waterfront offers exquisite seafood and steak combinations, chicken entrees, pasta and a wide selection of appetizers. Banquet facilities, live entertainment, but most of all, the view. 401 to Liverpool Road, follow the East Shore Marina signs. If you miss us, you're in the water. Community, local business, and Rogers Television, working together to keep you better informed.